1490 AM. This is your host, Dan Weaver. And before I introduce our guest today, there's a few housekeeping things to take care of. We've been talking about the auditions for the film, The Last Frankenstein. Those are being held today at Fulton Montgomery Community College from noon to five. So if you want to go there, you have about an hour to get up there. Now there's been a change as far as the additions in Amsterdam are concerned. Uh, there was a pipe break at the Creative Arts Center. So the auditions next week will be held at the Clara Bacon School on Henrietta Boulevard, noon to five. And then on March the 8th, auditions will be held will be held, I'm sorry, this is WCSS, this is not WVTL, and I hope I don't lose my job over this. Uh, we were just talking about Bob Cudmore before I went on the air, so that may be very well why I had that Freudian slip, which I hope Joe will not happen again. Anyway, this is WCSS, 1490 AM. Um, so those, the, the next week, the uh, auditions will be held in Amsterdam, and then the following week, March 8th, they will be held at the Fenimore Gallery at Proctors in Schenectady. Children ages 8 to 13 are needed, and adults of all ages are needed. Now, last week I started a contest, and if you win the contest, you will get a free copy of my book, uh, my, my only book I've ever written, uh, The Virgin in the Strip Mall, and other essays about Amsterdam, New York, the Mohawk Valley, and upstate New York. The question was that you have to answer is what well-known deceased actor met his wife in Amsterdam and where in Amsterdam did he meet her? Many people guessed. The guesses given so far and they're all wrong are Broderick Crawford, Malcolm Atterbury, Harold Gould, Ed Sullivan, and Kirk Douglas. Those were all good guesses because they're either people from Amsterdam or people from the uh, area. So now I'm going to give Ed a new clue. Amsterdam celebrated this actor with a special dinner at the Antlers Country Club on August 18, 1950, and Herbert Shuttleworth, Vice President of Mohawk Carpet Mills, presented him with a proclamation, August 18, 1950. Now, you can call me and leave a message on my cell phone, which is also my business phone, from now until 1215. You can leave a message with your answer. That's 842 7504 or you can uh, email me the answer or Facebook. My email is Daniel T. Weaver at gmail.com. Daniel T. Weaver at gmail.com. And another follow up from last week, we had an email from a listener. And we talked some about film last week, films related to Valentine's Day, the romance. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about film today because tomorrow is the Oscars. This email uh, from Jerry says this, you mentioned on Valley Vox that no film adaptation of Cooper's Leatherstocking Tales was filmed in the area. The Last of the Mohicans, which aired recently on TCM, may be the exception. I have a book published by the Ad ADK, Guide to Adirondack Trails, authored by Linda Lang. Page 191 of that book describes the .7 mile trail to Broomstick Lake. The trailhead is located about one mile north of Pine Lake on the west side of New York State 10. According to the narrative, the 1936 film, The Last of the Mohegans, used the relatively flat east shore of Broomstick Lake as the location where the movie's stockade was built. The wiki article in the 1936 movie makes no mention of Broomstick Lake, stating that the movie was filmed entirely in California. The film did have an Academy Award a nom nomination. I hiked into Broomstick more than once and we found no direct evidence to support the author's claim. However, you have to remember that Mother Nature is quick to reclaim the forest. And that was from Jerry Frick. Uh, I, I do remember that movie quite well. Randolph Scott played Hawkeye in that film. That was before we got around to deciding that it might not be a bad idea to have Native Americans playing Native Americans. Anyway, today we have with us Carl Strock, who many of you are familiar with as a journalist, a columnist, and uh, I would say maybe somewhat controversial person. Would you would you admit to that, Carl? Or <laughs> well, I probably confess it's not something I necessarily seek. But I guess if you provoke contra controversy by definition, that makes you controversial. Now, now we're familiar with you from 
the uh, Schenectady paper, but you worked for other papers. You mentioned at least one of them while we were out in the waiting room. C would you just tell us a few of the other places that you worked for? You know, it's hard for me to remember. I worked for the Gazette for so many years. I have to, you know, stretch my mind to get back into ancient history. We were talking about my having worked for the um, uh, South China Morning Post for a couple of years. That was um, <clears throat> around, uh, that was for a couple of years, around 1980. I really cut my teeth in journalism, however, with the Associated Press. Uh, during the Vietnam War, I covered Laos for the Associated Press. That was really my beginnings in um, my beginning in journalism. Okay, so some of you, some of the articles you wrote uh, when let you cover Laos, those would have appeared in numerous papers and uh, around the world. Or right. Yeah. Right. Okay. So today, what we want to talk about, because now that um, Carl is retired or semi-retired, I don't know how you would describe yourself. He's no longer writing full time for the Gazette, that's for sure. But he does have a blog on on the TU. Uh, by the way, this station has a connection with the Amsterdam Recorder, and I, I don't want to forget that. I want you you to know that. But Carl never wrote for the Recorder, so today we are talking about some other newspapers. But um, uh, the I don't know if you call it the official newspaper of this station is the Amsterdam Recorder which is a, a great little town newspaper. But Carl has a blog on the Times Union, and uh, maybe I should ask you, what is it like doing a blog as opposed to doing a column for a newspaper, doing a blog that only appears on the Internet? It doesn't appear in print, I don't believe. That's right. That's right. It appears only on the Internet. Although I believe, I don't actually see the hard copy of the Times Union, but apparently they do occasionally pick out excerpts from something they consider notable or worthwhile. And I think on Monday on the op-ed page, they'll, they will print brief excerpts. And several times they have excerpted my blog for, um, for the print edition of the paper. But as a general thing, it appears only online. That's correct. Okay, and, and how have you found that experience, blogging as opposed to writing a column? It really takes some getting used to. Um, there, are, there are several important differences. One is with a column, you're on a fixed schedule. At the Gazette, I wrote three columns a week, uh, Tuesday, uh, Thursdays, and Sundays. So you get into, you know, kind of the groove of, you know, of, of producing. You've got a deadline. You've got three deadlines a week. Whereas with a blog, there are no deadlines. You do it as often as you want. And sometimes I'm conscientious about it, but most often I'm not conscientious. Um, and, you know, you do it whenever you feel like it. A blog to be really successful, I think, the person has to has to post material on there frequently, regularly, and I don't do that. If I post once a week, that's good production for me. And uh, what kind of response have you gotten? I mean, do you have a following? Do you know how many people are reading your blog? Yes, I do. We're, uh, I have access. I have access to those. Um, uh, statistics that the ordinary reader uh, would not. I can see how many hits it's getting. And I would tell you how many it is, but it's so small it's embarrassing, really. <laughs> um, the, um, the, the, other, the other big difference is if you want to respond to a column in the newspaper, you write a letter to the editor, and every newspaper that I'm aware of has the same requirement. You have to give your real name, and you have to give your address. The, uh, the newspaper has to be able to contact you to verify that you are indeed the writer of the letter. Uh, newspapers do not run anonymous letters. And for reasons that escape me, the whole world of blogs is different. Yes. The whole world of online newspapers is different. People can comment uh, using pseudonyms. They have to identify themselves to the paper itself. They have to be registered. You register with your real name. But, but for purpose of posting your comment, you do it with a pseudonym, which I dislike immensely. I think it encourages uh, rudeness. I it agree. encourages incivility. If you and I are looking at each other as we are right now here in the studio, face to face, and I disagree with something you say, I'm probably not going to call you an idiot. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to insult you. It's just, a, you know, basic civility comes into play. The same with writing a letter to the editor when your name is going to appear 
and not your street address, but your the town or city of your residence appears. Sure. So everybody knows who you are. With a blog, you it's sort of like shouting at somebody from behind a curtain. I think it's a lousy idea. It encourages rudeness. And so for me, that is one of the big differences. I attract, as I think a lot of bloggers attract, people who must be, I don't know, I, I try to imagine who they are with these nasty, you know, belligerent comments that they post. Um, I, I don't get it really. I don't. I don't like that. I don't like that culture. Well, it seems too to to uh, bring the reputation of a newspaper down to even on uh, not just the blogs that a newspaper has, but let's say regular news stories. You have the same thing happen, and there, and most newspapers apparently don't have anyone to to watch the comments all the time. And so you get you got all these comments appearing that just seem to me to bring the reputation of a newspaper down by the fact that they're even there. Yeah, um, and um, actually the way it works at the Times Union, I'm not sure how it works at other um, online uh, newspapers, but I do control, the blogger does control what comments appear. That is, before the readers see them, I see them. Right. They come to me. I am not allowed to edit them. I cannot change them in any way, even by a comma. But, uh, but I can approve them for publication or disapprove them. And when I first started doing this, I pretty much automatically approved everything. But as time has gone on, uh, there, are, there are a couple of people who post comments that are just so persistently um, belligerent and ignorant and um, insulting. And I think they just do nothing to enhance the reader's experience that I've begun to kill some of those. Sure. And we're going to turn now to the, your recent blog called what is uh, what is it with America which is about the film America American Sniper which you went to see and I noticed there were 181 responses to that piece you wrote and many of them fall in fall into the category and as you said it, you didn't even allow some comments to make it to the to the blog uh, but even some of the comments that you did allow seem to reflect this uh, rude mentality and also filled with logical fallacies, which it seems to me that when somebody responds to a, a blog, a newspaper column, or a story, that uh, you know they shouldn't be using logical fallacies, but then maybe the schools aren't teaching that today, what logical fallacies are and, and why you shouldn't use them in arguments and so on and so forth. But anyway, what I want to do, and, and, and the reason I wanted Carl on today is because the Oscars are tomorrow, and this movie has been uh, nominated for six Oscars, I believe. I think that's right. Right. I, I want to read a little bit of it. I won't, don't want to, you know, make things too heavy by reading too much. But I want to read uh, sections of this and then ask Carl some questions based upon what what he said. So he starts out this way. I just saw the movie American Sniper, about which you have probably heard plenty, and like some other people, I find it disturbing, though not much more disturbing than the Somali pirate movie Captain Phillips or the thousands of cowboy and Indian movies that preceded it. Just another tribute to straight shooting Americans up against jabbering savages, even if with its own peculiar touches. The genuine American hero is, or was, a Texas good old boy by the name of Chris Kyle who joined the Navy SEALs to do battle with Islamist terrorists and in four tours of duty as a sniper in Iraq registered 160 confirmed kills, supposedly the most in America's gaudy military history. The movie is based on a book that Kyle wrote with the help of a novelist and a lawyer, but unfortunately it leaves out some crucial material. Like Kyle's statement, quote, I never once fought for the Iraqis. I couldn't give a flying F about them. And his admission, I love killing bad guys. It was fun. I had the time of my life being a SEAL. And his report that he spent his spare time playing video games, watching porn, and working out. Rather, it, pre it presents him as a decent down-home Texas dude who loves his country and manfully does his duty by it, all his kills being of armed male savages with the exception of one woman savage and the act of throwing a grenade at a noble at noble Americans and one child savage about to throw a grenade at noble Americans now another review was written by Chris Hedges who grew up in Schoharie and won the Pulitzer Prize and uh, he wrote he wrote a review after seeing this film called killing ragheads for Jesus 
Now, if I look at the first part of that title, Killing Ragheads, and I look at what I just read about what you said, I have to ask the question, were there any positive portrayals of Iraqis in this film at all? Or did it mostly portray them as savages? In, in, it's typical of this uh, genre. There is one uh, decent, honest Iraqi that I remember right off the top of my head um, who cooperates with the Americans and promptly gets killed by the, by the other um, Iraqi uh, savages. I say, for the, for the genre, that's typical. Okay. So it's, it's, it, it, by genre, you mean uh, war movies in particular, or? I mean, what I call generically cowboy and Indian movies, which is us good Americans up against them, up against them jabbering savages. So, so this movie wasn't a lot different than uh, some of those westerns that used to be on television all the time? I think it's the same theme. It's the same, it's the same basic, basic theme. This is much better done. You know, technically, sure. I suppose it's a great achievement. Um, you know, as far as, you know, cinematography and all the rest of it goes. And, um, and even the acting. Um, which I thought was, you know, was really uh, quite convincing. It's the simplistic view of the world. There is no suggestion at all in the movie, not the slightest hint, of how Americans happen to be there. You know, you see these good, noble Americans on the ground in Iraq, looking through their scopes at these, you know, screaming savages who are, you know, killing children. And how do they happen to be here? What's going on? What's this all about? You don't, you don't have a clue. You know, that the Americans precipitated this chaos by overthrowing the dictator of that country. So, you know, sent the country spiraling into chaos. There's not a suggestion, not a suggestion of that. We're just there. That's a given, right? Chris Kyle and his buddies, these good old boys from Texas, they're there. And what they see is a bunch of these savage maniacs running around, killing other people and trying to kill them. You know, to call it simplistic is almost, is, is almost a kindness. It's beyond simplistic. It's simplistic to the point of, you know, misrepresenting reality. It's simplistic to the point of stupid. So I guess what you're saying then, that the movie lacks context. It, it certainly does lack context, but even beyond that, it is the, the glorifying, you know, we're expected to identify with this Chris Kyle, who is, let's say, he's murdering people is what he's doing. You can argue that those people deserve to be murdered, but even so, it is nasty, nasty business. You know, to be sitting up on the top of a wall, taking aim at somebody and shooting them in the head 160 times, actually a lot more than that, because those are the number that were confirmed, Right. and the movie gives you to understand he's certainly succeeded in killing more savages than that but you know nobody actually saw the corpse so it wasn't confirmed well and and this guy we're expected to sympathize with his troubles you know we we get the feeling after a while he's disturbed by his experience um, but he is not disturbed this is clear by what he has done he is disturbed by what he has seen other people do what he is you know he has seen the rottenness of these savages mm -hmm. meaning the Iraqis who are resisting basically the American occupation he has seen what horrible people they are and this kind of torments him you know you can see he's kind of scratching his head having a hard time dealing with this he's not having a hard time dealing with what he does right now, and, and if I understand it, in the book, any, it doesn't seem like there's any, I haven't read the book, but I understand in the book there isn't even that. There doesn't seem to be any kind of being bothered about by anything. Is that, I, is that I, correct? I confess I did not read the whole book. I okay. just couldn't bring myself to do it. I flipped through it and I read passages here and there. I kind of, I kind of skimmed it. Okay. So on that basis, I don't want to, um, I don't, I don't want to talk about the book except obviously, I mean, I did find there are some statements in there that are much franker, like his enjoying porn, yeah. for example, about him not giving a flying F for the Iraqi people, that kind of stuff, which would not play well in a Hollywood film. Right. Now, at least four Iraqi veterans have written reviews tearing the movie apart. One of them was in Salon.com. His name was Garrett Reppenhagen. And he, he, the title of his review is, I was an American sniper and Chris Kyle's war was not my war. And I just want to read a brief uh, quote from what he said. The movie depicts compounded action scenes with very little political and regional context. It was a conscious decision by Clint Eastwood, apparently, to leave out the cause of the U.S. invasion and subsequent occupation of Iraq. It was a conscious decision, apparently, 
for multiple characters to describe the Iraqis as savages and never show any alternative. When I heard of the bigoted reaction some Americans had after watching the film, I was disgusted, but not surprised. Audience members are mistaking Chris Kyle's view of the war as the story of, about the war. And here are some tweets that viewers tweeted after seeing the film. American Sniper makes me want to go shoot some effing Arabs. Cheered up at the end of American Sniper. Great effing movie, and now I really want to kill some effing ragheads. Here's another one. Just watched American Sniper, and I feel like killing every sand, N-I-G-G, -G, you know, on the effing planet. So, they, I, th I think that is exactly the emotion that the movie looks to inspire. If you go in there kind of with an open mind, and by an open mind in this case I mean an empty mind, uh, you don't know anything about the history of the war, you don't know anything about the rest of the world, and you just absorb the impressions given to you by the movie, sure, that's the only thing you could conclu conclude. God, let me go kill some, you know, let me go kill some savages. Right. I mean, that's all you see. And here's another thing, ta talking about context, if I can add this in, sure. uh, Dan. We are shown uh, Chris Kyle um, being uh, impelled to sign up for the military, to go join the Navy SEALs. After he watches on television, we see him watching a television set of the World Trade Center being attacked. And he is really moved, as indeed all Americans certainly were really moved. I remember sure. my own reaction. Yes. You look at this, oh my God, what horror. So he goes, he goes to sign up, and the c impression is clearly conveyed that the people he's fighting in Iraq are the people who attacked the World Trade Center, which is an absolute misrepresentation because we all know Saddam Hussein and Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. That attack was carried out by Saudis. Right. Most of the attackers were Saudi Arabia, a, a country with which we are on the coziest of terms yes. because of their supply of oil. Sure. And you would never know that. You would think that the that these you know savages Iraqi savages were the people who attacked 9/11. So that is that is I say just a, a vile misrepresentation as far as I'm concerned. Just one of many. Well, while my boss is in the room, I want to remind you that we are on WCSS 1490 AM. Our guest today is Carl Strock. This is your host Daniel Weaver. This is Valley Vox. This is WCSS. I have to remind myself so I don't screw up again. So let's move along. Uh, let me read another quote from your review. What I most enjoyed about the movie was the connection it made between hunting animals and hunting humans. The show begins with our hero as a youngster out in the woods and with his father shooting his first deer and his father giving him a stern instruction, never leave your rifle in the dirt which comes across as one of life's most important lessons. And then two and a quarter blood spattered hours later, it ends with our hero back from the war, leading his own son out on their first deer hunt and telling him, it's a blank of a thing to stop a beating heart. We're going to do it together. So, you know, this is a very rural county and there are many hunters in it. So, <laughs> so let me ask you were, you, were you saying here, as some people seem to uh, believe in the comments that were made, are you saying that you are against hunting? Uh, no. No, I'm not against hunting. Um, I, I eat meat. I'm not a vegetarian. I have no problem uh, killing animals for food. I find uh, the killing of animals for sport uh, to be, um, uh, I, I find it offensive. Um, I'm not on principle. They say killing animals for food is fine. Killing them for sport, I find that very, I find that very unpleasant and kind of distasteful. But the the reason I put that in, Dan, actually, I had made some comments before about guns. Mm -hmm. We had a, several horrible instances elsewhere in the country of children either being killed or killing adults. Very small children. In one case, a two-year-old to get right. hold of an adult's gun, shoot the mother in the face, kill the mother. Really horrible things. And I made some um, I, I made some disparaging remarks about gun ownership um, and uh, gun freaks, as I call them. Uh, it came out of the woods and bombarded me with uh, belligerent comments on the blog. And um, they said, you know, I seem to be s suggesting that you know hunting animals leads to killing people. And I hadn't really said that, but they read that into it but now I go see this movie and there it is the connection is very clearly made sure in this movie it's the movie that's making it it's the movie you. that's making the connection not me right the beginning of the movie is Chris Kyle the sniper as a little boy 
being taught to hunt by his father. And this is presented as something noble and worthy. It's a great father-son bonding thing. They're going to go out and kill an animal together. And his father gives him this supposedly profound instruction. Never leave your gun in the dirt. You know, something to carry through for, you know, an instruction to carry with you for life. And then at the end of the movie, you know, it comes full circle. And there he is with his young son out in the woods, pats his little boy on the shoulder, you know, son, it's a hell of a thing to stop a beaten heart. We're going to go do it together. Now, uh, isn't that wonderful? I was shocked by that. To be Isn't, honest, isn't that wonderful? I, I don't get shocked very often anymore, but for, for somebody to say to his son that it's a great thing to stop a beating heart, right. I, I, was, I was shocked. I was shocked in the movie, and, I'm not, and I don't understand why other reviewers didn't mention it. That right. I saw Chris Hedges, with whom I do not agree on a lot of things. He's really, I think, a sort of a left-wing ideal. Oh, he is a left-wing ideal. Yeah. yeah, and he ripped the movie to shreds, every horrible aspect of it, but never mentioned that. Right. Um, yeah, we're going to go stop a beaten heart together. Isn't that wonderful? A guy has just come back from murdering 160 savages, human beings. Now he's going to teach his boy, you know, we're going to go out and we're going to kill a deer together and sort of keep the killing going. You know, I'm going to teach you how to kill and maybe you can grow up to be a killer like me is the suggestion. I found, I found it appalling. It, it is appalling. Whether you like guns or not or like hunting or not, it seems to me to be appalling. And we got time for one quick question maybe before we have to go to a break. You say, what is it with America, this love of killing, and what is it also with the pious Christianity as demonstrated by Kyle sitting in church, packing a Bible and tattooing his biceps with a crusader's cross? He said in his book, I wanted everyone to know I was a Christian. I had to put in red for blood. The movie leaves that out and gives us only a fleeting glimpses of the tattoo. Is it possible, do you think, and of course, Chris Hedges brought up the Christianity thing in his uh, review as well, especially in the... Uh, uh, in the title, Killing, Killing Ragheads for Jesus. And, and actually, maybe one that you're going to have to answer this after the break, but let me ask you the question and you'll have time to think about it. Do you think it is possible that you and Hedges are doing to Christianity uh, what this film does to Islam, especially when you consider that some high-profile atheists, for example, Christopher Hitchens in particular, supported Bush in the war, uh, in the war in Iraq, are you? Are in other words, are you stereotyping all Christians? Are you labeling all Christians as being warmongering or what have you, in in, in the things that you have said? Okay, and this is uh, WCSS Valley Vox. We're going to go to a little break now, and we'll be right we'll be, be right back in about five minutes. Fourteen ninety a.m. Your car, we go in. Taking a look at the weather brought to you by Patriot Federal Bank, proudly serving Fulton and Montgomery County since 2005, with locations on Route 30 in Amsterdam, Erie Boulevard in Cannon Jerry, and North Comrie Ave in Johnstown. I'm Tim Everhart with a little weather for the Cranesville Radio Network. Today, a little morning sunshine giving way to increase in cloudiness, light snow breaking out near or shortly after noon, with increase in wind, cold with temps slowly climbing into the mid 20s by the evening. Tonight, cloudy skies, occasional snow with wind of 5 to 15 miles an hour possible, low in the mid-20s. Tomorrow, snow ending between 6 and 9 a.m. in most locations, remaining cloudy with patchy freezing drizzle possible through the afternoon. Less cold with a high in the mid-30s. I'm Tim Everhart, and that was a look at the weather for the Cranesville Radio Network. This weather report brought to you by Patriot Federal Bank, proudly serving Fulton and Montgomery County since 2005, with locations on Route 30 in Amsterdam, Erie Boulevard in Canajoharie, and North Comrie Ave in Johnstown. We offer a variety of savings and checking products as well as commercial, residential, and consumer lending. At Ace, we're known for being helpful, and we're always looking for new ways to do so. Well, guess what, neighbors? We're now even more helpful by saving you big right inside the store. That's because ACE offers instant savings to ACE Rewards members. All you have to do is be an ACE Rewards member when purchasing select products, and you'll save right at the register. You don't have to wait weeks to get your deals, because frankly, that's just not as helpful. Not an ACE Rewards member? That's no problem. You could just sign up when you get here to start taking advantage of our offers. It's as simple as that. Stop into the Riverfront Ace Hardware in the Riverfront Center in Amsterdam or give them a call at 684-6100. So come in now and get instant savings at Ace, the helpful place. See store for details. Must be an Ace Rewards member to receive instant savings. Available through the end of the month. B&B &B Foundations features estimating, excavating, and foundation work. 
In business for over 30 years, B&B is fully insured and ready to take on your project. Give them a call at 993-4405. That's 993-4405. B&B Foundations, the only name you need to know for your estimating, excavating, and foundation needs. Funerals serve an important purpose. They allow us to recognize a life that was lived and acknowledge that the life has come to an end. Funerals exist for the living, for survivors who suffer the loss of a loved one. At Betts, Rossi, Bellinger & Stewart, 171 Guy Park Ave, Amsterdam, we understand that families are different. Influences of religion and cultural traditions, cause concerns and personal preferences make each funeral as unique as the person being honored and our funeral directors will discuss the many other options and details that make each of our services a personal, lasting tribute to your loved one. These include a traditional service, a graveside service, a memorial service, and a cremation service. Betts, Rossi, Bellinger, and Stewart Family Funeral Homes, committed to excellence in funeral service. 171 Guy Park Ave, Amsterdam. Call 843-1920. Big bands, the roots, the future. Hi, this is Mark Edwards. I'm your host, and I hope you join me for a mix of jazz, show tunes, and of course, big bands. With the big bands sound, both old and new. And it's not what you think of when you think of a big band show. You will hear songs from artists like Tony Bennett, Michael Bublé, Lady Gaga, Marilyn Monroe, and more. Big bands like Glenn Miller, and all of the company big bands you've heard in the past and some currents. That's Saturday at 4 p.m. on WCSS. I hope you join me. Have a very wonderful day. Uh, look at the big tobacco display behind. This is Dan Weaver, Valley Vox. We're back with our guest Carl Strock on WCSS 1490 AM. And I asked Carl a question right before the break, and he's going to answer it now. The question was, are you doing to Christians with what, you, what you've said about them in, in your review and, and other, other times, and is Chris Hedges doing the same thing that other people are, have done to Muslims? Well, I, I hope not. I mean, both Islam and Christianity are very large tents. Uh, just as, you know, the great majority of Muslims in the world are perfectly peaceable people who go about their business like anybody else, and there is a small minority of raging fanatics, you know, dangerous, dangerous, um, in, my, in, my, in my opinion, maniacs. Um, you know, so in Christianity, I think, you know, the great majority of Christians are ordinary people, you know, going about their business. Some of them are, you know, much better than ordinary. People who run charities and do a lot of good works because they think they're doing what Jesus wants them to do. But there is also, you know, let's not shy away from it, there is also a strain in Christianity that is militant and belligerent, that, that likes guns very much. I remember a couple of years ago, the church, had, you know, had a special, you know, open house for guns to, you know, show its support for guns. I think it was South Carolina or somewhere. Right. somewhere. Uh, the people who write to me who are, you know, profess to be believing Christians and they're, they're they're big on guns. Uh, the movie makes the connection. I didn't make the connection. Um, you know, that shows him with the, or the book, rather, I should say, the book more than the movie, but the movie, too, to some extent, you know, shows him as a Christian, a Christian who likes to kill likes to kill bad guys. This is, you know, I didn't make it up. That's yeah, in the movie. Yeah, that's in the yeah. movie, and it's, it's even more so in the book. He is a devout Christian who tattoos a crusader's, not just any cross, but the distinctive crusader's cross is tattooed in red on his biceps. He wants people to know he's a Christian, and what he's doing is out assassinating uh, bad, bad people. In, in his view. So there is a connection there that I think cannot be ignored. And it does not, I don't think it reflects on all Christians, just as, you know, the maniacs now beheading people in Syria and Iraq does not reflect on all Muslims. But it's there, right. and I don't think you can deny it. I don't think you can deny that some Muslims are maniacs, and I don't think you can deny that some Christians are self or self-righteous killers. Well, I, I grew up in a fundamentalist home, and, and, I, and I can't argue with you. Your point is well taken when it, re, when it ref, uh, refers to fundamentalists and evangelical Christians. It's true. Many of them are right-wing. Many of them are pro-gun to the point of 
ridiculousness and uh, very pro-American to the point of being unwilling to recognize any mistakes and many of them got behind George Bush, got him elected and George Bush could do no wrong for them as far as they were concerned. So let's move along. I'm going to have to skip some things because as usual there I have more material than, than time. Let's talk a little bit more about guns because you mentioned at the end of your, your review the fetishization or fetishizing of guns. Now let me read from another review something that wasn't mentioned in your review and ask you a couple questions about that. Even more telling are the film's final two scenes, the one about him taking his son out hunting, which you, you mentioned, but there's another one. In the Kyle household, someone walks through the living room holding a six-shooter, the kind you would find in an old western, not in a contemporary war. We can't see who it is, but we do see Kyle's children in the background. It's an ominous, dangerous moment, but our nerves relax when the camera pulls back to reveal it's Kyle himself engaging in some sort of extended foreplay with his wife. He enters the kitchen, points a gun at her, and orders her to drop her drawers. The tension eases momentarily, but it still seems odd that Kyle would play around with a real, possibly loaded gun in front of his small children. And the way Eastwood's camera frames the pistol in isolation invites us to think critically, not about Kyle, but about the gun himself. Do you, do you remember that scene? Yeah, kind of vaguely. You know, I didn't comment on that. I guess it didn't. I'm, I'm not sure why. During the movie, you're in the dark theater, sure. of course. I sat on an aisle seat, so I had, you know, the little bit aisle light thing, right, right. and I was taking notes. Ah. I was taking notes as it went along. I don't I don't remember making a note of that. But uh, it, it just seems as an absolutely bizarre thing. First of all, that, you know, somebody, it seems like something more out of, in fact, for a minute, I'm thinking, wait a minute, but did I read about that in a review? of Fifty Shades of Grey, or did I read about that in a review of, uh, of American Sniper? Yeah. And, and, and telling his wife to drop her drawers sounds like something out of a rape scene. I just... Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I remember, I mean, of course, you know, guns have a, um, have long had, I think, an intimate uh, connection with uh, sex, if for nothing, uh, no other reason than, the, you know, the phallic shape of a gun barrel. And certainly, you know, it, you see that frequently in movies where a man is threatening a woman and he will be rubbing the, you know, the barrel of his revolver against her face. You see that in a couple of James Bond movies, you know, where the bad guy <coughs> is right. menacing a woman. And, uh, you know, the, the, the phallic suggestion is, is, is pretty obvious. Well, it, it, it just struck me as, as being a very, very bizarre thing to, to, to use a gun in that manner. Um, Jesse Ventura was asked some interesting questions on Fox News, and Ventura said, a hero should have honor. A hero is not how many people you killed. You know, he's obviously a great sniper. He's obviously a great shot. He obviously did his job correctly. And he's talking to Alan Combs. Alan, let me fire this one at you. Do you think the Nazis have heroes? Combs, well, obviously the Nazis were fighting for a cause we can't condone. Ventura, wait, 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 when they invaded the country, when they invaded Poland, when they invaded France, and if a Nazi, Nazi soldier killed 100 people that had lived there, would he be classified as a hero in Germany? So I'm not going to finish that, but can there be any heroism in a, in a war that's in a war of aggression, an illegal war? I mean, for example, were, were there German heroes in World War II? I'm not talking about German dissidents who were executed, like um, the young woman and her brother, I can't think of their name right now. Can you have... Can, can there be heroism in an in a illegal war of aggression? Well, not not from my perspective. I mean, certainly from the aggressor's perspective. I'm, I mean, I imagine that the that the Germans, you know, regarded their soldiers as heroes. I guess. I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, certainly from you know my perspective, uh, they would not be uh, they would not be heroes. I mean, I think you have to be fighting for a just cause. Would be my would would be and even and even fighting for a just cause there are still things that are that are unpleasant like even granting that the America's cause in Iraq is just which I do not accept I mean I think it's a misbegotten adventure that has just produced you know chaos uh, even so it's there's something very unpleasant about you know sitting up on a rooftop taking careful aim at a human being you know 500 yards away and you know blowing his brains out sure it's not something I can say gee what a wonderful guy he is the best I could bring myself to say would be under these terrible circumstances it's a necessary job 
if, if we were being invaded and our American soldiers, you know, sniped at the invading soldiers, I'd say that is a necessary job and, you know, good job done. It's still not something you'd feel, I'd feel good about. Well, I think the best way to look at this would be to take this film and compare it to uh, Audie Murphy and to Helen Back. And Audie Murphy was a World War II hero who was cited for bravery many times, killed a number of people, but was never, never happy about it. Uh, it never glorified it and, and the film itself to Helen Bag does not really glorify Audie Murphy and what he did and uh, so I don't know maybe this is a change in the way films are, 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 are being made today I'm not really sure but I would I would uh, advise anyone who's seen American Sniper to, to rent to Helen Bag with Audie Murphy and, and make an, a, a comparison and, and contrast and I think there's a major difference between the two films and how Audie Murphy, who actually portrayed himself in that film, how he presented himself to the public and the, I thought, humility that he presented and the unwillingness to glorify what he had done and, and or to even have any happiness or, or, or thrill out of it. Well, we need to, do, to move on to another subject because we're running out of, uh, out of time. Carl uh, published a book called, Turning, uh, called From Deberg, that stands for Duanesburg, From Deberg to Jerusalem, The Unlikely Rise and Awful Fall of a Small Town Newsman. I want to particularly talk about the last few chapters and why you felt you could no longer write for the Schenectady Gazoo, as you call it, in your book. Can you briefly summarize what happened to you and why you no longer write for them? Well, it was it was a, it was an unfortunate and to me um, unexpected occurrence. <clears throat> I went to um, uh, Jerusalem uh, after a long career at the Gazette of writing mostly about local affairs. I uh, went to Jerusalem on a vacation, uh, not not for the Gazette. Just my wife and I, we went on a trip just to see the sights, uh, basically, and uh, got my eyes opened. I had never cared very much about Israel and the Middle East. hadn't paid much attention had the vague idea that you had two peoples fighting for the same land, um, you know, Jews and Arabs, and, you know, locking horns, and it was something that did not particularly concern me. <clears throat> and when I got there and had the opportunity to visit the West Bank, um, my eyes were opened, and it was, uh, it was stunning to me that, you know, I realized that the Jews in the Middle East were the conquerors, the invaders from Europe and Russia, where they had come from, and that the Palestinian Arabs had been displaced. You know, European and Russian Jews had come and overrun the country little by little, had conquered the Palestinian Arabs, and continue to this day to grind them down underfoot. And it's not an equal contest. It's not a conflict. It's often portrayed as a conflict, which seems to imply, you know, more or less equality between the two sides. It's not that at all. I mean, it's like, you know, European settlers coming to this country and dispossessing the American Indians. Indians and taking their land. That would be, you know, a, a, a closer approximation. And I wrote about it accordingly. And I, you know, since I've been very critical of religion in general, uh, principally uh, Christianity, right. um, had mocked uh, Christianity. Uh, pretty mercilessly, especially fundamentalism. You were. <laughs> and, um, and Roman Catholicism, too, over the creation of this, you know, this silly Saint Cattery, uh, you know, nonsense. That well, was, now you're in trouble in this county. Um, I'm in trouble in Montgomery County talking about that, that farce. I actually wrote a piece sort of, sort of uh, uh, in opposition to what you had said. I don't know if you remember reading it, uh, but somewhat of a gentle piece. I, I wasn't really... Not you should either. never write gentle pieces. Well, that's they true. Don't, <laughs> they, don't, they don't sell paper. They don't sell paper. I, I, but anyway, having, uh, I thought, established my anti-religion credentials in that way, I also mocked uh, Judaism, the practices I saw at the Western Wall, the famous Western Wall, um, you know, the, the shenanigans, the, you know, the sanctimonious carryings on there, and the use of Jewish mythology, mythology to justify the conquest and disposition of another people, you know, this pretense that this land is ours because God gave it to us. Um, so I did all of that, and the result was a campaign gotten up against me in Schenectady, led by a local rabbi, and joined by several other prominent uh, Jewish citizens, including the owner of a certain uh, supermarket chain uh, that I will not name. 
Um, <clears throat> and uh, they got up a boycott of the paper, and the long and the short of it was that the Gazette instructed me not to respond to those attacks on me. And they had been attacking me, and I'd been responding, and they instructed me uh, not to respond anymore. I was not to, I was to shut up on that subject. And that, to me, was just unconscionable for a journalist, that I could um, ridicule uh, Protestant fundamentalism, I could uh, ridicule Roman Catholicism in a city that is largely Roman Catholic, Schenectady, you know, with large Polish and Italian right. um, Irish uh, populations. I could get away with that, but I could not get away with uh, ridiculing uh, Judaism and with um, telling the, the bald truth about Israel, <laughs> about the conquest of the Palestinian people. That, to me, was absolutely unconscionable. Well, why, and, why is this? Why and Under those circumstances, sure. I, I retired. Right. That's why I left. That's why I left the paper. I retired under duress. Well, and it's very clear that, okay, people can, can, can assault Islam. I mean, look at Charlie Hebdo and Vance. But even in our country, you can get away with saying whatever you want about Islam, uh, pretty much. I mean, Rush Limbaugh and those guys do it, Sean Hannity. Uh, is you can get away with, with saying what you want about Christianity. I don't know about Hinduism and Buddhism because I've really never heard anyone go after them much. So, I mean, why, why the difference here? What, what is it, do you think? I you think the idea? difference is, is traceable to the long history of the persecution of Jews, especially in Europe. Okay. You know, a, a thousand years, two thousand years or so of pretty grisly history of Jews being a persecuted minority. I mean, persecuted, you know, to the point of, uh, of genocide. Um, you know, most astoundingly in, in World War II, that there is a great sensitivity <clears throat> and understandable sensitivity on the part of Jewish people to being, um, uh, to being uh, disparaged. Right. And I think, that's, I think it's understandable. That's a good answer. Uh, um, and, and for that reason, I think I had never done it. Right. You know, when I ridiculed Christianity and I ridiculed the Bible, which is a book richly deserving of ridicule. Um, I omitted any reference. I mean, even though, you know, the preponderance of the Bible is Jewish, almost all the Bible is Jewish. Sure. I ridiculed it from the perspective of Christianity. Right. And I did that consciously. I thought, do I want to put in, when I was writing Heard on Protestant fundamentalists, do I want to put in, you know, the Jewishness of this? And I consciously did not. Because it just seemed, having been grown up more or less as a Christian, it seemed to me poor form for me to, to me to disparage uh, Judaism, disparage the Jewish religion, given the long history sure. of anti-Semitism. I, I think that holds a lot of uh, writers back from, criti from being critical of Israel and uh, a, a number of uh, are critical of, of the Jewish re religion. Um, we're, we're running low on time. This is WCSS 1490 AM, Valley Box. This is your host, Dan Weaver. Our guest today is Carl Strzok, and we have a couple more questions for him. It, it, it's obvious that the Gazette didn't want to offend people, but I wonder if the bigger issue was the potential boycott by this particular grocery chain and the loss of advertising revenue. Um, has the line between news and advertising been crossed more lately in the news business? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely it has with this thing. Not in print newspapers so much. Not so much in the Gazette and the Times Union, but especially online, the so-called native advertising, yes. which is adver advertisements masquerading as editorial material. But I thought this was a crossing of the line, sure. I mean, you know, the, the Jewish um, uh, community leaders uh, who reacted so strongly to my writing? Sure, some of them are advertisers, some of them are subscribers. They're you know they're prominent people, and whether the the threats were explicit or not, it's it's understood. I mean, if you get major advertisers coming to this radio station or to the Amsterdam Recorder or to the New York Times or any other news outlet complaining vigorously about what you're doing, it's sure. I mean, it's in, it's understood whether it's stated or not. You know, they could pull their ads they could cancel their subscriptions yeah and I think it's I think it's very unfortunate and I think it's uh, very unfortunate that I was um, 
Uh, you know, I, I, I would have objected, but I would have understood if earlier the management had told me, look, you can't make fun of the Catholic Church. You can't make fun of St. Cattery. We have a lot of Catholic readers, as the Gazette does. We have a lot of Catholic advertisers. You can't do this. Lay off religion. I probably would have sighed mightily and, you know. Right. But I could get away with it with the Catholic Church. I could get away with it with the Protestant fundamentalists. But I could not get away with it with the Jews, with Jewish leaders. That did that to me was just insupportable and inexcusable. And I would not I would not accept that. Well, and I know from being a faithful reader of the paper uh, that you say faithful deliberately. Is that a um, yes, yes? <laughs> as opposed to atheists who read it who are unfaithful <laughs> readers. <laughs> no, uh, that. Um, there were you know, many letters written against you and what you said by Catholics and Protestants, but was there ever any kind of organized, what, did you ever perceive there was an organized campaign against you from Protestants or Catholics or fundamentalists? Uh, I couldn't say if it yeah. was organized or not. There was certainly a lot of opposition. There were a lot of angry letters to the editor that were printed. A lot of uh, call, angry phone calls to me, which I which I fielded, and I think we all considered it. It just sort of you know it goes with the territory. Right. If you're writing a column and you're expressing strong views, you're going to get strong reactions. And there were several times when I thought the managers of the Gazette were not entirely happy with what I was doing. They kind of mm -hmm. rolled their eyes. Yeah. And I remember once being asked, you know, when I was ridiculing the Catholic Church over this you know saint business. Um, I remember one of the manager of the Gazette asked me, what are you trying to achieve? Mm -hmm. you know, do you think you're going to convince you know, the little old Italian lady up on Goose Hill? Do you think you're going to change her mind? And so they had reservations about it. And I, I guess I had reservations myself. But nobody ever told me to stop. Right. They put up with it. And I, I was very grateful that they did. I thought that was, I thought that was exemplary uh, journalism. And I do think, to the Gazette's great credit, they allowed me to say things in print, ridiculing Christianity that I don't think any other newspaper, the Time Union, Times Union included, mm -hmm. included, would have tolerated. I, I would agree with that. Uh, now, looking at the news business in the thirty-some years you were in it, did. I'm not talking about technological changes because obviously there have been a lot. Did you see any changes in the news? Did the news business, is news business better than it was 30 years ago? Were the worse? Is it the same? Uh, investigative journalism, that is an example. Is there less of that, more of that? Um, hard for me to say. There's never been much investigative journalism. You know, 90 percent, 95 percent of journalism is passing along what government officials say and what, you know, the government wants you to know. You go to city council meetings at the local level, you cover Congress at the national level, you cover the UN at the international level, but basically you're telling the readers what people in power do and say. You're not digging behind it, right? Right. That's ninety percent of what you see on television, what what you read in the papers, and it's only a few, um, um, you know, major outlets that have the resources, like the New York Times, principally. It has the staff, it has the money to can you know they can afford to do investigative work. Local newspapers have never done much of that they've done they've done very little they don't have the resources they do some you know the right. Gazette has done some the Times Union has done, mm -hmm. has done some you know Kathy Moore ha did a little bit and, and you yeah. yourself actually I, con I considered some of what you did as investigative journalism especially going into family court and bringing to light some of the things that were going on in our local family courts so it's some of the work I'm I must I'm glad you mentioned that because I may I guess I can say I'm proud of the work that I did <clears throat> with family court something that was not known to most people not known to most readers and I think that's what newspapers at their best are digging up stuff that is not generally known and maybe and often stuff that government doesn't want you to know <laughs> exactly and that, and that's what I as I said earlier that's one of the reasons why I've always appreciated Carl in spite of the fact that I am a Christian and he is an atheist. That, but one thing we have in common is a desire for justice, for justice for especially those people in life, the poor, uh, single mothers with several children and, and so on, uh, prisoners and whatnot to, that don't seem to get justice. They don't have the money to buy it. And Carl was very good at bringing these things out and I always appreciated that. Even if he did 
sometimes slap us Christians around a little bit, but often those slaps were deserved, <laughs> especially uh, uh, with with some of the shenanigans that go go on in the Christian religion that I'm part of. Uh, some of it's just frankly embarrassing. Uh, Jim Baker and all these. Uh, famous evangelists and all their nonsense that they pulled and the prosperity gospel telling people you know you you send us money and you'll become rich and all this it's just it's just uh, to me as a Christian it's all bogus has nothing to do with Christianity and this Kyle guy who goes out and kills 160 people uh, uh, savages has a tattoo on his arm goes to church and read the Bible and then he goes and watches porn and video games and uses his gun as foreplay with his wife and to me, as a Christian, that's just totally bizarre, and yet I know there are Christians that think this movie's great because they have conflated their religion with their nationality, and, and, and they become confused. One last question, and we barely have time to answer it, but do you see areas that the media spends too much time on, and are there, and actually this is kind of, maybe even we've already covered it, are there stories that are not being covered or not being covered enough? And maybe one of them is this thing about the West Bank, uh, the Palestinians. You, you see think, it in the leftist press, but in the, in the mainstream media, it's a little hard I, to find. I think I was, I was, I continue to be stunned because since returning from Jerusalem, it's been almost three years now, I've, I've studied um, assiduously um, Israeli and uh, Palestinian history, and it is amazing to me what I have learned. I think, I, I, I think of it as the great bamboozlement. The American people have absolutely been sold a bill of goods on Israel. We do not know the true history of that country. We do not understand that basically Jews came from Europe and Russia and conquered an Arab country, drove the Arabs out, those they, 750,000 they drove out, those they could not drive out, they continued to grind under their heel. I think it's a disgrace, and I think most American people do not understand it, and that is the fault of the media. And on that note, we're going to end this uh, week's edition of Valley Vox. This is Dan Weaver, your host. Thank you, Carl, for coming on today. I really appreciate it. I'll be back next week. I'm not sure who we're going to have on next week. We may possibly even take calls, so tune in next week.